Hey, how y'all doing? Okay. Now, I get it. I'm a dumb flat earther. I don't know physics. I don't comprehend. I don't understand. I'm stupid. I'm retard. Yada, 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 yada. Okay. I'm all that. So I'm not going to try to tell you anything. But, YouTube is demanding that I do this presentation and allow the YouTube helicopter flight instructors to present case of physical fact that helicopter flight on a spinning sphere is physically impossible. Now, this video has material that may be copyrighted, but due to the nature of this video being uh, for educational and informational purposes, it is exempt from any potential copyright infringement strike. So, uh, since I'm so stupid and YouTube insists that I let their pilots speak, I will. But what brought me here, first of all, let me show you. I've done videos on this very topic here of helicopter flight being impossible because I'm a dumb baltard or sphere flat flathead whatever I'm, I'm a flat tard I don't understand the physics of helicopter flight see I don't even know if I'm a baltard or flat tard anyway because I've been both so is what's going to happen here is this uh, Black Hawk helicopter is going to fly out here I'm on double speed, it's gonna come out here and it's gonna come around over here 30 seconds later after flight. You're gonna have a light airplane come through here, hit the turbulence and crash. Here's the helicopter flying back through, here's the airplane crash, bang. These guys are on their way out, they don't even know that they caused this accident. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking to myself, well, how would a chunk of wind turbulence just stay there like that? And when you think about it, you see a swirl in the water and, and they do tend to stay in one place and hover around in one place and when it's in a still water. And water and air are, carry the same exact characteristics. You see, water or liquid is just a more condensed, liquefied state of gas which air is gas so they have the same exact flow characteristics I don't have the time to prove that to you you can do your own research on that and prove it to yourself so anyway uh, the two helicopter pilots who are going to be Proving by physics the impossibility of helicopter flight on a spinning sphere is going to be Jacob at Helicopter Lessons in 10 Minutes or Less, whom I have had intercourse conversation with, and he claims ignorantly to uh, the theory that the atmosphere spins with the spherical Earth due to the... Uh, length of time and whatever it's been spinning so all the atmosphere spins or whatever that's that's what he told me and I give him uh, I replied on his reply to my comment that uh, these NASA documents dot a dot are proclaimed flat earth he never replied but uh, anyway so let's let uh, Jacob here at flat earth in or I Helicopter flight lessons in 10 minutes or less. Explain to you how airflow at a hover works.
characteristics based on the airflow um, through this, these rotor systems. So let's start first with in-ground effect. While we're sitting here at the ground, at a hover, this airflow is coming in vertically through the disc. So let's do The it. disc is actually, just in case you're wondering, it is the entire radius of that helicopter right there. And right here, this would be a plan view looking down at that same helicopter. It's coming into the disc, and then as it gets closer to the ground, it hits that ground effect, and it gets pushed out. So it's coming vertically and pushed out and away from the disc. Now also, on the tips of the rotor blades, it's starting to get a little bit of a rotation, a swirling. Wingtip vortices. Wing vortices, as, it call, as it's called. And now this is going to affect some of the lift characteristics as well. Okay, let me just stop you right there for a minute, Jake. At this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, this rotor wash is hitting the ground right here it just over this is on uh the hughes 500 plugging the values into the above formula and hitting the square root key on the calculator results in the downwash velocity at the rotor being approximately 34 foot per second or 23 miles per hour but we haven't completely answered the question yet. Keep in mind that this speed is at the rotor disc. As the column of air is forced down below the rotor, it constricts much like molasses being poured out of a pitcher does. In doing so, it reaches its maximum velocity at one and a half to two rotor diameters below the disc. Consequently, the final fully developed downwash velocity can be shown to be two times the above calculated amount or 46 miles per hour in our Hughes 500 example. So this wash right here, it hasn't had time to create its turbojet I'll show you here in a minute what I'm talking about with the turbojet so this downwash is rolling down and being forced out at 23 miles per hour outside of this disc while the Coriolis wind speed with the rotation of the earth at the 45th degree latitude it's five, supposed to be 520 miles per hour. The helicopter rotor wind speed is in ground 23 miles per hour. At this point, looking at the plan view, you would have to think that this 520 mile an hour wind has absolutely zero effect on this 23 mile an hour outward wind that's inside of the disc being washed down. You would have to really think that the 520 mile an hour wind would not overpower the 23 mile an hour wind and blow the wind away and create the helicopter to nose down and suck over and flop. Anyway, let's get back onto Jake and let him get onto the out of ground. So, in ground effect, coming in vertically, as it gets closer to the ground, it's getting pushed outwards. So we have this induced flow. It's kind of interrupted a little bit with the ground effect. We have the wingtip vortices. Now, 23 mile an hour wind right here. Some of the same stuff's going to happen here in the OG, the out of ground effect, but the, uh, the lift characteristics will be slightly different. So now that we don't have the ground in near proximity to the rotor disc, this airflow is coming in and continuing to come straight down through the disc without any kind of ground interference. You have to stand corrected there, Jake. I'll show you in a minute. Now, without that ground interference, these rotative vortices are going to be able to develop even bigger than when we were in the ground effect. Enough of your physics there, Jacob. Thank you very much. All right, so we have different yeah, There you go. Okay, so now these uh, wingtip vortices now are larger. You have the wind speed coming down here at 23 miles per hour. Once it clears these wingtip vortices, the surrounding air now begins to funnel the 
uh, downwash into a finer jet stream creating a higher lift. That is why when you are sitting in a helicopter and the pilot increases the pitch to create the lift, as soon as the helicopter begins to lift, the pilot has to back it off or the helicopter will continue to lift because it's as it lifts, the further it lifts, the more pressure that same amount of pitch is creating, the higher it goes. It, it bottlenecks down and creates a thrust reaction. Now, let's get on to our second pilot, Kenny Keller over here at Helicopter online ground school he's going to teach you about the wind physics so what i want to say is you know as far as training goes in the beginning you know you want a fairly calm fairly nice day you don't want a whole lot of wind as you progress through the training and you get better and more experienced you can handle wind a lot more than what you did in the beginning and it's even advisable to go out as you're going through your training before you can say the private to go out on an extra windy day at least a couple times with your instructor and let it beat you around and get to know that feeling of what it's like when it's kind of uncomfortable in the wind speeding you around but you know, as far as like say solo, we don't let students usually go much over 12 knots. We usually sign 12 knots. We do not let students usually go over 12 knots solo. 12 knots is only about 13 and a half miles per hour, people. Or less for a solo. And then as far as EMS flying goes, we didn't have an absolute limit. It was up to the pilot and up to the crew as far as what we really would go out in. And I can tell you that in general, when it gets much over, uh, say, 30 knots, it starts getting pretty, uh, pretty rough. And then again, it depends. Okay. Here we go. You can fly around in this thing. It'll be pretty smooth at 20 knots. It's pretty smooth and you hit a 30 mile an hour gust and it gets a little rough and then it smooths back out. You hit uh, 40 mile an hour winds and you get a 45 mile an hour gust and it's rough and you can come out of it again. But you notice every time the wind increases, it's blowing further. The further down you come into the wash, the further the wind penetrates into the wash. You have your 20 mile an hour winds, it's just barely penetrating the wash, even at the bottom. Your 40 mile an hour winds, it progressively penetrates into the wash further and further. You get an 80 mile an hour wind and it literally blows the wash away you would literally tumble if you had an 80 mile an hour wind flight by a helicopter on a sphere is impossible and on you know 30 knots can be not bad if the wind is fairly steady and smooth but let's say it's 15 or 20 gusting 30 that could be pretty darn uncomfortable so it really depends on the pilot depends on the crew what they're comfortable with the most winds i've been up in as far as you know, current winds is 45 knots, and that was in a Jet Ranger, and I really didn't care for that really at all. And then flying the BK-117, I did an approach to a rooftop once, pretty tall rooftop, and with winds gusting somewhere around 45, and that was pretty darn uncomfortable. So, not saying you can't fly in those higher winds, but it really can be, or it really can be very, very uncomfortable. So, you know, it kind of varies. See, he just told you, 45 mile an hour is the most he's ever really been in, and it is very, very uncomfortable. That's only 50 mile an hour winds, people. 45 knots, 50 mile an hour winds. Very, very uncomfortable. This man here, he is an emergency medical pilot. Mr. Uh, Jacob on the other channel, I don't know what he is. He acts military. He, to me, I don't know. But. So there you are with the wind. How much wind is too much? 12 miles an hour on a Novus uh, solo flight. This guy here, emergency pilot, been doing it basically his whole life. 45 miles an hour. He ain't going up in anything more than 45 miles an hour. He basically just told you that. Now let's look what happens with the loss of the tail rotor. To encounter LTE due to the normal certification thrust produced. I'm going to stop this for a minute. Although meeting certification standards, he starts it's not always able to produce the additional thrust demanded by the pilot. So first, let's cover the three winds that you have to be familiar with 
so that you don't get yourself in an LTE situation. First, we'll talk about main rotor disc interference. If you have a wind off the quartering left front, degrees 285 to 315 degrees, and winds at velocities of 10 to 30 knots from the left front cause the main rotor vortex to be blown into the tail rotor by the relative wind. This main rotor disc vortex causes the tail rotor to operate in an extremely turbulent environment. So try to visualize a great big huge dog. Let me stop this here real quick before he gets into that. Okay, uh, you'll notice people that helicopters, their boom prop there, their stabilizer prop, is outside the radius of the rotor so that it doesn't have to contend with the rotor wash. And coming, the wind coming from this angle is what he's telling you. You have your wingtip vortice out here. And is what it's going to do, the wind coming at this angle, it's going to blow that wind into, or the wingtip vortice into that rear stabilizer prop, and you're going to have all sorts of disturbance, and you're going to have a rough time. Around the outside of that rotor system, turbulent air being recirculated, and that wind coming on that angle is pushing all that dirty, turbulent air into that tail rotor. The second is weathercock stability. Winds from 120 degrees to 240. In this region, the helicopter attempts to weather vane or weathercock its nose into the relative wind. Unless a resisting pedal input is made, the helicopter starts a slow. I can have a visual of a wind 100 mile an hour coming from behind that. You know what that's going to do. It's going to flip it over, ass over tea kettle. Uncommanded turn either to the right or left depending upon the wind direction. If the pilot allows a right yaw to develop and the tail of the helicopter moves into this region, the yaw rate can accelerate rapidly. In order to avoid the onset of LTE and the stalling. And if you're setting at that position in a 80 mile an hour wind, you're rolling. You've already here. You're not attached. Gravity does not attach solidly anything to earth or nothing would move once it touched the earth. We've already seen, this is 23 mile an hour wind coming down and out. This is lifted off the ground. This view is this view. Looking sideways. Your wind would have to hit, you got a 35 right here, you got a 46 mile an hour wind on the downwash of the rotor. You have a 520 mile an hour wind from the Coriolis effect. You would have to think that the Coriolis effect somehow affixed a wall and pushed the entire column of air away from the wind rather than what you know would happen with your own logic and reason of this wingtip vortice actually chewing up this wind as it came into it but regardless that 520 mile an hour wind is going to overtake that 23 mile an hour downwind and blow the lift out from under you and you're going to crash now the wind going over the helicopter right here is going to automatically draw more wind more air, turbulence, will flow towards the front of the direction of the wind. It's drawing in more wind at the front of the rotor in the direction towards the wind than it is the tailing of the wind. This wind in the back of the rotor from the wind direction has to come from a higher above and down. This is all coming from in, sucked in first. So it all comes down from above to be shot down. And that's how this works. And if it, that's why in even uh, 35, 40 mile an hour winds, that's all it'll do for this wingtip vortice here to be able to chew up the wind, the physical wind that we all feel and see the effects of. And this would emulsify it and like I said in this uh, it would emulsify this too 
this 520 mile an hour wind would come in here and blow this 46 mile an hour wind clear the fuck out of there people helicopter flight is impossible on a spinning ball so I'm not here to tell you what to think I'm just here to present the facts and show you the common sense, the logic, and the reason, and show you the physical reality of what you would see. Water and air have the same exact flow patterns. Guaranteed. Anyway, folks, you make up your own mind. Be well.